Dr. Roger Capello, and I'm going to ask you some questions of the ACL in terms of pediatric patients. Of course. So first question, what do you see as the correlation between immature knee and obtaining an ACL injury? Um, so the correlation, I mean, I think that the immature knee is definitely at risk for getting ACL injuries. I think there's a couple of different correlations, of one of which is um, kids at a younger age are getting involved in uh, very aggressive sports at a really high level uh, and doing it year round. I know when I was, you know, 11, I wasn't playing, you know, uh, uh, sort of academy basketball or academy soccer year round, but I have a ton of patients even younger than that doing that. Now those kids, even though they're very accomplished in their sport, they may be really fast and great at scoring goals, they still have a nine or a 10 or an 11 year old body. Mm -hmm. And so their body can't necessarily withstand the rigors that they're doing in their sport. And so I think that puts them at risk because they're not training like a 15, 16, 17 year old athlete and the body changes that correspond with that athlete. And so I think that does put them at risk to some degree for, for getting ACLs. It's just a combination of, mm -hmm. it's a high level of sport, like if they were an older adult, but they're not. Their bodies are that of a younger person. So. That's the reason like, why they tear their ACL, why many athletes tear their ACL? Well, the ACL tear is usually just a, it's a biomechanical failure of the ACL. What the ACL does is it resists the tibia or the shin bone uh, sliding forward against the femur. And there's some rotational component too. And so it's usually a non-contact injury where they plant. So I think one of the reasons they may do it is because uh, poor technique. So if you have good technique when you're cutting or pivoting, you lower your center of gravity. I could show you if I stood up. Lower your center of gravity and shift directions. If you have a high center of gravity, then you have all this momentum pulling you forward. So you step to make a cut and your, your ACL fails. Now, yeah. the other reason is because secondary stabilizers to your ACL are your quadricep muscle and your hamstrings and some other muscles around the knee. Again, they're not trained like a big, strong 16 or 17 year old athlete. They're nine or 10 or 11 year old. They haven't even hit puberty yet and all the hormonal changes that help that athlete really get stronger. And so I think a combination of not as good technique with a body that's not quite as strong, I think puts them at risk. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. so the co correlation of the quadriceptic hamstring. Yeah, well, of, of, the, yeah the, of, the, of the neuro, uh, so the term you might have heard or used or something is neuro, the neuromuscular training. Mm -hmm. So the lack of neuromuscular training and poor technique in, a, in an immature athlete, I think would put, kind of correlate to cause an increased risk of ACL. surgery for an adolescent patient or try physical therapy first? Well, I'm very conservative, and so I think for any adolescent patient, um, you would try physical, uh, well, if for any skeletally immature, that's our industry speak for, they're still growing. I think you, you should try um, bracing and physical therapy. Now, there's some data to suggest that the failure rate of that's pretty high, and I know some doctors probably would go straight to therapy, or straight to surgery, but I'll usually try that. If it's a skeletally mature athlete, so let's say a 15-year-old that's done growing, I would pretty much go to ACL reconstruction, because I think the data is out there that if uh, the long, the natural history of somebody with an ACL tear is that you can get premature arthritis. So I always tell the athlete, I'm doing your ACL reconstruction because you want to get back to sport, but I'm doing it also so that you have a somewhat normal knee when you're 25 or 30 or 35 and don't have premature knee arthritis. Um, but but in, in the skeletally immature knee, because although there are new techniques that work pretty well that spare the growth plate, the risk of growth plate damage um, is such that I think it's always a good idea to try conservative treatment, just in general. Okay. Therapy embracing, yes ma'am, that's right. So you would probably recommend um, surgery for like 16 and up if they're like a mm. huge athlete, and then like 15 and down for... I would say, well, so the age is not as much as, because I've had fully grown 13 year olds, right? They're done yeah. growing, right? Yeah. And so I would say for a skeletally mature athlete, I would recommend ACL reconstruction when they do it, or maybe a, a couple weeks of prehabilitation to get the range of motion and strength back. Uh, for the skeletally immature athlete, I would recommend physical therapy and bracing and, and just seeing how they do. And if, if their knee is continuing to give out, which are the symptoms of the ACL, then I would sit them down and talk to them about the options, including a, a, a technique of ACL reconstruction where you spare the growth plate or you decrease the risk of damage to the growth plate.
Um, in terms of surgery, which graft is your preference with the ACLT? So my so preference. Yeah. So in the mature patients, my, my preference is uh, the the uh, bone patellar tendon uh, graft. So patellar tendon auto graft. Um, okay. There's a lot of different options out there. I reviewed the literature a couple of years ago, and my understanding from the review of the literature is there really isn't a superior graft. It's sort of what we call dealer's choice, right? So yeah. whatever is best in your in my hands. The bone, the patellar tendon autograft is the best one. Now, because of the way that's done, that puts um, the growth plate at risk <clears throat> for growth plate damage. And so for skeletally immature athletes who fail conservative treatment, it's usually a hamstring graft is what's done because that decreases the risk of damage to the growth plate just by the way the technique is done. Now, there's other options in adults. Um, like a, um, an allograft, which is tissue that you get from the bone bank. I know that's very popular these days. And, and one of the reasons it's popular is because part of what hurts is taking their own tissue, right? So you don't, yeah. you don't have to do that part. You just, you, you get ready to do the ACL, you get everything ready, and then you use someone else's tissue. The reason I don't do that even in a fully grown, let's say 17 year old is because I can't be guaranteed from the, the tissue bank that they're going to give me someone whose tissue is belong to a, someone who, who deceased that's under, like, say, 25 or 30 years old. I don't want to put an 80-year-old tendon in a 17-year-old patient, even if they're fully grown. So I don't do that that way. Um, but I know a lot of folks that do, and I don't think it's a bad option. That's just philosophically why I don't do it that way. Okay. Um, when you see an adolescent, what is the specific thing to look for when first diagnosing an ACL tear? Uh, well, a lot of times it's a mechanism of injury. Um, it's usually a non-contact injury, although it can be a contact injury. It's usually, I was cutting, I tried to change directions, my knee gave out, and then it blew up like a balloon. So it's, it's uh, the mechanism of injury. It's uh, swelling. Usually there's a large component of swelling. Um, uh, and then really it's the ACL tests. There's one called the anterior drawer test. There's another one called the Lockness test, which is the one that I use. And that's where you're testing how much of that movement that I talked about what the ACL does. Uh, there's another test called the pivot shift test, which is a little bit more, I, I believe, uh, specific for the ACL. Mm -hmm. Problem is it really hurts. And so usually that's something that we do um, as a confirmatory test when the patient's asleep in surgery, because usually they don't relax enough that you do a pivot shift test. They, they kind of tense up and then the tests aren't, aren't very very useful. So what are some circumstances for non-contact versus contact injury? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, so like, have you, in terms of like patients for non-contact injury, what have you seen and then for contact injury? Non-contact is usually a cutting, a cut, uh, like they're, they're, they planted their leg and, and they're changing direction and their knee just gives out and buckles. And that's really what you see a lot like if you watch football or basketball on TV and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, I very rarely see it as a contact injury. Now, sometimes somebody will get bumped, like in basketball, you'll get bumped and you'll come down awkwardly because you got bumped, but it wasn't because that person hit your knee like mm -hmm. that. Usually a direct contact, like let's say you're playing hockey or football and someone just drives into your knee. That doesn't happen very often, to be honest with you. You'd think it would, but that can usually create a multiply injured knee. Injured knee. So in other words, <coughs> your medial collateral ligament could be at risk and then your ACL as well. But I mean, I'd say I see that less than 10% of the time. It's, I would say 90% of the time, a non-contact injury. They just, their momentum took them a certain way. Sometimes they say, oh, my cleat got stuck kind of funny or something like that, and just biomechanically things went wrong. Okay. Returned activity protocol for an ACLT? Uh, my returned activity protocol, so usually I get them in physical therapy, um, and the first six weeks they're working on range of motion, decreased swelling, reactivate the quadriceps. Um, usually at the three month mark, I have them start what we call uniplanar activity, which means running in, in, in line or in a circle, but not back and forth. Mm -hmm. And then if everything's going well at the five month mark, I'll usually release them to full, what we call multiplanar activity, which means cutting, pivoting, things like that. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they feel perfect at five months. That means they're then cleared, as long as their therapy's been going well, from my standpoint, they're cleared to begin that journey back to all of those activities. Uh, um, I, my understanding is there may be some protocols that are a little bit faster than that, but mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been failed by that one, so I'm, I'm pretty conservative. I mean, I, you know, at that point, you've, you've, done, you've done four or five months of rehab. I'd rather us take it slow and, and not risk a repeat injury after that. I think that that it depends on the athlete. Some athletes are super sub motivated. They're doing the home exercise program. They have a good support system. Their school trainer knows what they're doing and stuff like that. In that instance, you know, if they've 
is somebody that I've known now for six months, right? So they've demonstrated over time that they're really conscientious. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with them stopping the therapy at that point because they're just stopping formal therapy. They're still doing physical therapy. Yeah. It's just independent study. Uh, if I've had the opposite end of the spectrum where patient didn't get the range of motion back very well, it's clear they're not doing the home exercises, their quadricep muscles still very atrophied or smaller than the other side, and in that patient, I'll usually tell them, look, I'm, I'm releasing you. But honestly, sometimes I don't release them at that point. I tell them, you need to get stronger before I feel comfortable releasing you. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but in that situation, I, I realize that if they, don't, if they don't do formal therapy, they're not gonna get any therapy because they're not doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. So in that patient, I'll have them do it longer. So it's really just dependent on each individual. People, to be honest, we see people fall off before they should probably. So we, with the protocol, a lot of times we'll look at good leg to surgical leg mm -hmm. and like I want my yeah I want my people to be I would like them to be almost 90% mm -hmm. on their surgical leg before mm -hmm. they start going back to stuff like that mm -hmm. but we have those progressions those sports mm -hmm. progressions so mm -hmm. we can use the protocols too mm -hmm. and um, I just we just met as a company with another doctor from the care clinic mm -hmm. and he gave us his return to sport protocol which is pretty awesome so that's something that I want to implement now with a lot of my athletes too and it takes the testing itself takes about an hour to an hour and a half, but it's just a bunch of different planes of movement and balance and stuff like that. And if they can't perform it, then they can't go back to sport. So it's a test. It's not like a program. You know, you know, jumping in a unilateral plane and sticking it and things mm -hmm. like that, then they can't even go into the mm -hmm. lateral stuff. So it's kind of progression. It's kind of cool for you. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. I'm looking to learn that. Yeah, it's kind of neat. And I, they have an athletic trainer that works there that does all their testing for them. Mm -hmm. So it's my goal to take either Emma or you know one of my other PTs and go there and watch him do his testing so I can get better cool. at it too. Yeah. They're a little less concerned but when it comes to kids you definitely want them strong or they're going to re tear again. So. Are most of the docs that you remark so yeah. for the first six months back to sport and then I'll make it optional. And then you'll let it optional. And I don't know that there's any science behind that. Yeah. I think it's probably just I sleep better at night. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're protecting your work ultimately. Yeah. It's your work that yeah. you're protecting. Well, I think just repeat ACL doesn't always go as well as the first one. No, no, so. and that's what that strength back for yeah. sure beforehand. But yeah, I think football's the one thing that I do see people wearing the bracing a lot more when right? you go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a soccer one time tell me that so she got back to sport. She's probably at about seven and a half months. And she'd been back to soccer for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And she called me and, and her parent no, I think she called me. No, it was a visit she came in. And she said, hey, can I stop using my brace? And I said, well, I would prefer you wear it until you get to the one year mark. Is there a reason? And she said, well, some of the girls in the other teams are pretty vicious. They see my brace yes. and they go for that leg. And so I want to take attention away from that leg by not wearing my brace. And, and so I said, that, okay, take it off. I've heard that before, too, yeah, for sure. That's crazy. People will definitely yeah. that same thing. Like that's if your, your knee should be able to stabilize itself, probably, mm -hmm. when you're going in the group environment. Yep. So. Amber Ingram, my mentor and a physical therapist. And we're just going to talk about rehabbing for an ACL patient. So first question, what type of treatment are turning up ACL patients? Um, it's a little bit of everything. So in the beginning, it's a lot of movement, like me helping them get their range of motion back and bending and straightening and then um, trying to get the swelling down with ice and electricity and um, then doing the exercises. So the exercises eventually will be the main parts to get them back to where they want to be with sports or with life in general. Popular sport you've worked with um, soccer, um, yeah, so I usually girls more than boys, um, but yeah, girls are more prone to ACL tear than soccer, but yeah, soccer's a good one because you have to plant and pivot. Um, we haven't seen here a lot of football players, but that's a big one too, like just planting and twisting really quickly. That's challenging part when it about you in ACL um, Usually pain is pretty high, so now we're getting patients pretty soon after surgery. So when they come in, their pain is high and their swelling is high. And so just being able to push through that and being able to get their movement back. Um, and some doctors will restrict patients from being able to put weight through their foot for a good period of time. So just being able to get the strength back for walking normal and things like that. Yeah. Have you had a majority of patients come from surgery or not surgery? And what was you with the not surgery patients? Yeah, so we do, like, in this setting, we'll get most of them who have already torn their ACL and had surgery on it. Um, every once in a while, we'll get a patient that does not have surgery. And so their goal is ultimately just to stabilize their knees so that they can do their everyday activities without pain or, like, instability and losing, like, um, 
their balance or being able to walk without their knee buckling. So um, they're going to try to get as strong as they can just to do like their everyday walking or workouts or whatever. But um, usually the doctor determines if they need surgery. And so the ones that don't need surgery are kind of the minor, more of the minor tears versus the ones that are like completely unstable. Okay. Um, mechanics for extending and bending the knee. Mechanics. We talked about this one a lot today. Okay. Um, so with bending the knee, the lower part of the leg has to, um, it has to kind of slide up and the kneecap has to move as well. So when you're bending the knee to actually mobilize into that, is this what you want? Hopefully this information. Yes. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> the lower part of the, the leg, you kind of push it backwards mm -hmm. and that glides the joint so that it bends into more flexion. Now when you're trying to get extension or straightening of your knee, when the knee is locked out, um, we try to mobilize on the, the top of the femur to push backwards to get that knee to go into full extension. And then if they're if the patient's having trouble with their kneecap being tight, you can move it up and down and that the kneecap also glides when you extend and bend the knee, so just kind of moving it up and down. So. Would you always do manual traction with bending the knee? Um, traction? No, not always. Um, but a lot of times it'll give a little bit more space in the joint. Um, so with my ACL tears, I don't do as many mobilizations because I find that with just passive movement or stretching, they're going to get their bending back. Um, if it's something different, then the mobilizations come in a little bit quicker or a little bit more. Um, but distraction is really good. Like if somebody's having trouble bending, just pulling the joint where it loosens and opens it up a little bit will be more comfortable for bending it. Yeah. And question and challenges in terms of exercises. Um, well, if a patient doesn't get their muscle tone in their thigh back like you want, it's hard to progress them to things like jumping and um, even deep squatting because then it puts them at a chance for getting uh, tendonitis, which is inflammation. So the most common tendonitis to get after ACL um, reconstruction is a patella tendonitis, and your patella tendon goes from your kneecap to the lower bone in your leg. And so if a patient isn't really strong in their thigh muscles, a lot of times that tendon gets to overwork. And so that's one of the most common things that we'll find that kind of detriments therapy or pushes it back a little bit, is that maybe they're not strong enough to stabilize their knee, so that tendon gets really flared up or inflamed, and then they can can't do things because everything really hurts. Um, can you explain the tests, such as like the anterior door or um, the Walkmans and mm -hmm. then other ones that you test for? Yeah. Um, so normally when a patient comes um, post-op, you're not going to test for any of that stuff. So if I'm going to get a patient and I'm not sure if they have an ACO um, tear, the easiest one for me having small hands is the anterior drawer test. And so I'll get the patient laying on their back and their knee is bent. And I'm going to take my hands kind of behind the lower part of their leg. And um, once they're relaxed and trying not to tense up, you just pull that lower part of their leg. And you kind of feel how far it translates forward. And if it feels kind of loose or kind of too mobile, then we definitely check the other side to see how our other side moves. And then compare the two. And if the one that's loose is pulling forward too much, then there's a likeliness of a possible ACL tear. So yeah. Really kind of test mm -hmm. That's kind of like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we, and most patients, since we're not direct access, they don't come straight to us. They've seen the doctor. So most of the time, we either know if it's torn already or if it's torn, the doctor's done the surgery and then they come to us. So. Okay. What is your return to activity protocol for these cases? The protocols are? long <laughs> but there's different ones depending on what is repaired so sometimes the doctor will repair using the patella tendon the tendon that goes from the kneecap to the tibia and if they take a part of that then the protocol is different than if they take a section of the hamstring sometimes they'll take a section of the hamstring and they'll use that to, to fix the ACL too um, so the rehabs are a little bit different but it's usually um, two to three weeks where they're in an immobilized like extension brace so they're coming in to me and we're trying to work on bending but they're not necessarily putting weight through it and walking yet they're going to have crutches until they can walk normally which is probably about three weeks and at that point they're going to be able to hopefully bend about 90 degrees with their knees so they're going to be able to get on the bike and stuff but that first three or four weeks is trying to get rid of swelling, trying to get the muscles to work, like fire correctly. And then once they get that, then we work on walking. And so then that, like, 
probably three weeks to I would say maybe eight week time period is just slowly building strength like trying to work on um, just like mini squats going down to like deeper squats getting on the leg press doing some balance work and things like that and then it's after week 12 or maybe even to 16 depending on the doctor as to when they can start doing like some jumping and so a lot of doctors will require that their surgical leg has almost normal strength as the other leg before they start jumping Okay. What's the longest patient you've had to recommend? Um, for ACL? Mm -hmm. Probably four or five months. Wow. Yeah. So that 16 week mark is kind of the pivotal point for them returning to sport. And so it's actually a really good thing for them to stay that long. It's just people get really anxious. So I think the doctor had mentioned this too when we talked to him. Is people go back and play sports and things like that a lot quicker than they should. Now if you're talking about somebody who like just a normal mom that has an ACL tear, she's not going to sports, then I'm probably going to see them for probably 12 weeks, and then they're going to be done with me, and they're going to go to the gym, start their workout program. Hello, in Orange State, uh, we're just going to talk about your ACL. So first, how did the injury My first one, it was playing co-ed soccer, and the second one, it was playing bubble soccer. Yep. So was it contact or not? Um, the first one was not contact, and the second one was not. First one, I stopped and my body kept going and just popped and tore the ACL, MCL, LCL, and PCL. Um, and the second one, my husband hit me with the bubble and it stopped and I just felt the ACL. What was the most challenging part of that? Um, just not being sure of the instability and not being able to do my workouts to uh, the degree that I was used to doing. How did physical therapy help with that? So my physical therapist on the first one, it just helped give me range of motion again and helped build up my hamstring strength. And the second one, I didn't have surgery. So we just rehabbed it and built up the muscles around it. And I'm able to do most everything except for lateral movement. So it really builds up that strength. What is your rehab program? Do you remember? Yeah, my first one was a lot of um, banded movements and a lot of just plate movements moving some back and forth and range of motion movements. And my second one was a lot of the hamstring strengthening, a lot of quad strengthening. Since the injury, have you been limited to the movements you're able to do? And the knee that I had fixed, absolutely not. There's no limitations. I can uh, even touch my heels, my glutes easily. The second one I have, that I have not had fixed, um, there's no lateral movement. And I am limited to no, really no jumping and no sharp movements. What was the hardest part about coming from the injury? Like being comfortable and being a horse there? So, the injury that I had surgery on, um, the rehab was the toughest. The surgery was awful, and being in the machine, the reinforcing machine, 12 hours a day was tough. And just the level of pain and having to rehab so quickly after surgery. I only had two days and then in there quickly. The second one, the challenging part was not having the surgery and not really having the downtime and having to move back to daily life um, without the downtime of getting to rehab. Extremely